You're listening to The Virtue Podcast, brought to you by the Great Hearts Institute. Good conversations around the great conversation. Welcome back to The Virtue Podcast. I am Robert Jackson of the Great Hearts Institute, and I am so pleased today, distinctly, it is my pleasure to welcome David Clayton, artist, author, teacher, professor, uh, provost now of Pontifex University, and uh, uh, just remarkably active artist whose reputation has been made not only from his painting and his commissions, but his work to lead the new liturgical movement, his, his influence through Claritas, a journal for Catholic culture and the arts, and the various writings that he has produced to bring together sacred art, culture, and the connection of all of these things to the liturgy. David, welcome. I'm very happy to be here, Robert. Thank you. It was a pleasure for me to meet with you and your lovely wife uh, just a few weeks ago. I guess that was last month uh, mm -hmm. there at Princeton in your lovely home. And uh, the, the folks around the table, of course, were all about this conversation concerning the arts. We were convened with the Scala Foundations Conference. And uh, it, was, it was my distinct pleasure to discover that uh, the work you've been doing over these past decades has really come to fruition. There's a, there's a, there's a culminating work right now. It seems as though the arts, liturgy, sacred art in particular, and its influence on culture is really on the rise. Maybe mm -hmm. give us a little bit of backstory as to how this new liturgical movement has taken shape. <laughs> yeah, so my story is that I converted to uh, Catholicism, uh, uh, and well to christianity first and then catholicism um uh, about in my late 20s early 30s and decided that i wanted to be an artist and was looking for training and in the course of that uh realized that there was nowhere to train and so i really did start out just trying to do the research so that I could train myself. I, I, I had to get a little bit here, a little bit there, and look at the way that artists used to be trained because I was interested in uh, traditional forms of art and those forms of art that I thought would serve the faith, uh, that I, you know, I was full of the zeal of a convert and I mm -hmm. wanted to, to uh, be an artist and uh, promote through beauty uh, the, the the faith and the beauty of the traditional culture uh, had been very had been instrumental in my uh, developing a faith as well I would say um, so these all of these things work together uh, in the course of this I started to uh, develop to get this training myself and I started to paint and uh, I could see how uh, the understanding of this um, this sort of training was was lacking, and I started to write about it. And so, in the course of my career, I've done probably more writing and talking about the ideas of culture and the faith and beauty. Um, as I've done as much of that as I have. Uh, actually painting myself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Interestingly, you have a distinct approach. You mentioned this traditional approach and the forms that really attracted you. But what I found most intriguing is uh, a connection that incorporates mathematics and theology to the works of art. Uh, as, as, I, as I sort of think of this, you've discovered there's a synthesis here between number and creed and and poesis and the, the and the making of fine arts yeah could you describe a little bit of that to us because it seems uh, a, a bit distinct and, and different really from many many modern artists well the first thing i would say is that my background in education is in uh the sciences i, I studied uh, material science which is the physics of solids at oxford and i have a master's degree in metallurgical engineering so that's my educational background. Um, and uh, so I have a natural interest in trying to uh, approach things from that direction, even in art. My, mm -hmm. my approach tends to be systematic, systematic and carefully thought out, uh, not 
highly impressionistic um, and just sort of slapping my emotions on the paper, shall we say. Uh, yeah. So that's temperamentally, that's where I'm coming from. Um, the other thing that I would say is that um, I had an exposure as I was develop starting to talk to people in England to the Prince of Wales's school, as he was now King Charles the third, of course, mm -hmm. his school of traditional arts. And this was uh, set up with a strong emphasis on Islamic art and it had a sort of um, what you might call a sort of new agey uh, influence there. Um, and so I talked to the, the people involved there and they talked about sacred number and sacred art. And there was an architect involved in the setting up of that school called Keith Critchlow. And I went to talk to him and I realized that what he was describing to me as part of the traditions coming out of the, uh, the religious traditions of art is what was at the basis of a lot of beautiful traditional architecture in the West mm -hmm. as well. And so I became interested in this. And as a Catholic, I was a little bit wary because it, it was Islamic. It, uh, I think Keith Critchlow, he, he recently died. He described himself as a, a, a Neoplatonist Christian. So he was <laughs> slightly outside. You know, he was his own religion a little bit. A good man uh, gave me a lot of help and a lot of good advice. Um, but, but I, you know, new to the faith, I, I wanted to be sure that I was... Um, swimming in the waters of orthodoxy and, and not going off in a unorthodox direction. Um, and what saved me in this regard was reading Benedict the 16th book, The Spirit of the Liturgy, mm. um, as he was then uh, uh, Ratzinger, Cardinal Ratzinger. Uh, he wrote a book called The Spirit of the Liturgy, and he talked at length about these traditional ideas of harmony and proportion. He didn't go into the detail of the, the theory, but he talked about where it had come from. So he talked of figures such as Boethius mm -hmm. and St. Augustine, bringing the uh, ideas, the approach of, to mathematics of the ancient Greeks into Christian thinking, and then how that informed the, uh, uh, the uh, mathematical approach of the Middle Ages through to modernity. And so I felt that this legitimized the use of it. He is the one who connected the, the mathematical patterns uh, with the rhythms and patterns of the cosmos. So the, the motions of the planets of the stars in the sky, and then connected that in turn to the patterns of worship of the church, because the two are connected at a very simple level. You would say that Easter, for example, is always set according to the phases of the moon. Mm -hmm. And we have a calendar which is uh, really tied to the motion of the, the earth around the sun and the moon around the earth uh, and the motions of the stars as observed from the earth. And so the human pattern of living uh, is connected to our patterns of worship. And those can be described mathematically and then incorporated into the design of material objects such mm -hmm. as buildings and works of art. Mm -hmm. Fascinating that uh, what we refer to as the quadrivium in the liberal arts yeah. really does have this implication for, uh, for, for art, for fine and visual art, uh, as well as architecture and perhaps music as well. Uh, yes, it does. So the, the, the there is a tendency um, within the sort of classical education field, and correct me if I'm wrong, you're more deeply immersed in it than I am, um, to look at the texts that describe this, the, what you might call the fundamental text of the quadrivium, and to study them and appreciate them and view them as sort of hallowed texts that can't be improved upon or uh, that... There's, there's, they're the last word in what was done historically, so therefore we should do that now. Mm -hmm. um, I think that th the, what I saw in the School of Traditional Art, which was important, 
and also in the way that Benedict described this, is the potential for using those ideas creatively and even developing them anew, should we say, building mm -hmm. upon mm -hmm. those ideas mm -hmm. and even improving upon them, given that we are very used to describing the cosmos mathematically. That's what natural science does. That's right. Now, it does it in a, in a different way to the way that the ancients uh, had done. But nevertheless, the, the two, one could inform the other. And they always did historically. And so I, I was very interested in thinking about how this could be developed today. The other thing is that um, th there is an approach to uh, studying these things with a view to the appreciation of the culture and the, the art. So th there can be a connection between these texts and how the mathematics is incorporated or was incorporated historically into the design of buildings, into the dimensions of artistic projects, for example, and into the pattern of living. Um, but I, I, what was interesting, because I was coming at this from the point of view of an artist and I wanted to paint, I was interested in seeing how I could actually create things today. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. uh, and, and one of my interests in education is is incorporating both the appreciation of this and the understanding of it, but then also the creative application of it today. So that it becomes a living tradition which can develop and potentially surpass the glories of the past. There, there, there is a, a sort of always a backward looking pet, pessimism sort of inherent with conservatism. I think. Yeah, yeah. I view myself as a, cons a conservative. I, 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 I always want to learn lessons from the past, but at the same time, I always want to be optimistic and forward looking and say, okay, how can we learn and move forward and adapt the past and incorporate those ideas in such a way that they speak to people today and take us forward positively? Well, I think you're, I think you're absolutely right to point out a very real temptation, uh, maybe even a tendency within uh, conserving circles, uh, yeah. classical education is a, is conserving is, is yeah. conserving a tradition. Uh, but if we look at it merely as uh, as great works that are to be placed there and perhaps revered, even venerated, but their work and their thought remains static. If it if it isn't placed in con in, in, in into the context of a contemporary into our moment and how we might then learn from and as you said might begin to take up the mantle of these artists and these thinkers if it doesn't propagate if it isn't produced yeah. and reproduced then we've lost something of that of that living tradition as you as you described it yeah i i, I can just come in very very briefly there the, the there's an additional um idea behind this for me in that it isn't just about recreating the art and the, the culture of the past as an end in itself, which is, I think, is a worthy end. But there's a there's a greater mission here. A culture of beauty, uh, as Roger Scruton says, uh, or the late Roger Scruton said, um, tells us that we're at home in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, if we are in a society in which which has a culture of beauty, it it reflects the values of that society beautifully and it inclines us and inclines others very importantly to want to conserve what we have rather than to destroy mm -hmm. so much of the, the, the there's always something wrong with society at any time um and we we have a choice every time we note that we can say well can we improve on what we have and build it up and make it better therefore in order to do that we have to look for the good and expand that or do we destroy what we have and say it's just inherently bad and we've got to crash it all down and and start again i think that a culture of beauty inclines people to the former, which I think is the better way. And I want to preserve Western culture and I want to build on it and improve it and mm -hmm. not just replicate the glories of the past, but surpass them. 
<laughs> and I think that ultimately this communicates a, a, a set of values, a way of living and a faith that um, is good for society. That's right. Um, and I want that to be shared with people. I, I, they're the values that I possess and that's how I have a happy life. And I that's want right. those uh, values to be communicated. One other li little thing beyond that is that if we teach people in the way that I described, not only to appreciate beauty, but to create it, even if it's in the context of one field, which is probably what is possible in a school, say, mm -hmm. uh, we have an art specialist who can uh, go take students deeply into the way of creating art beautifully. Then what you instill in people is the capacity for creativity and following the traditional methods, the argument that was made traditionally is that it's, it, it, it does so in such a way that we are open to inspiration from God. This is the traditional hmm. mode of teaching. So I, I believe in God and I believe that's possible. And I think, uh, I think that we should be open to the idea. So once, once we do that, then that capacity for creativity can then be transferred from the, the student to any other field. And if we encourage then students to discover what their personal vocation in life is, not everybody is meant to be an artist, but some might be entrepreneurs or research scientists. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And these then become or, or political leaders, for example. Sure, sure. Now, now th this is a because it's rooted in beauty and a search for the common good. This forms people not only be to, to be creative, but to more naturally be inclined to contribute positively to society with the gifts that they have. And if we direct people to the, their personal vocation, in other words, to discover what those that facility for creativity ought to be applied to, then we have the answers in the conservative world to all the problems that the left presents to us. Uh, the, the, the left is very good at looking at the problems of the world. Very often they describe them accurately. But what we have to say, I believe, is we have an answer that is creative and is good and builds things up positively. And the best way to convince people of that is to form people who actually start providing answers. We actually pr have research scientists who create technology, for example, that works with humanity mm -hmm. rather than mm -hmm. seems to undermine it. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the, sooner, the sooner we can demonstrate that, the sooner we will persuade people that we have the answers. I'm, I'm, I'm certainly convinced that what you have written in this volume, The Way of Beauty, outlines for us a deep and powerful relationship between culture and the arts. But I, I was fascinated because you hinted at this with your reference to opening up the individual to, to God and, and to the yeah. prospect of God's calling for, on a life. You are arguing here that religion is a very distinct role to play in promoting culture yes. through the arts. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? Because I'd like to understand that connection, right? As yeah. you've said, important for any young person to be trained and shaped in this pursuit and this making of beauty. The arts themselves are going to instill every child with a sense <coughs> of what is beauty and then bring them some of that capacity of creativity, regardless of what field they end up in. But when you specifically mm. point to the notion of, of a transcendent, how does religion relate to this intersection of culture and the arts? Well, I'm going to speak as a um, from the um, the basis of my Catholic faith here, okay. and then try and extend it out sure. for people who have a, of other Christian denominations, and then even people who aren't Christian but might have, um, shall we say, the, the cultural sensitivities that, and therefore that I have, and therefore be sympathetic to what I say. So. Um, as a Catholic, I would say that the, the greatest um, influence on the culture 
is our attitude to God. The culture, we can look at a, a society as a whole and observe patterns of behavior. Um, so if you look at um, French culture, for example, how would you discern what French culture is? Well, you would look at um, lots of French people. You'd look at the products of French society over um, decades, over centuries, and look for characteristics that seem to embody the general attitudes of French people. And mm -hmm. I would say the same for American culture. As someone, I, I actually, incidentally, I became American um, about a month ago. <laughs> so <laughs> I have a particular interest in this, even though sure. I, I come from England, and I'm still proud um, of my British roots. Um, so we can look at certain patterns of the artifacts that are produced by a, a, a society, by a nation, and say that is the culture. Now, uh, it reflects the values of that society. We do things in particular ways, um, and very often without being unaware of it, it's, it's so deeply, um, these values are so deeply hold that we don't draw on them in our everyday activity for the most mm -hmm. part. It's only when confronted with choices that we have to think about that we even start to ponder over these things uh, but so therefore they are the values that uh, are held deeply but by which we just automatically respond to the things that we do uh, the choices that are, are in front of us on a daily basis and americans do that differently from french people and christians do that differently from islamic people now, the deepest value that governs our behavior is the, the fundamental question, does God exist or does he not, I would say. And the pattern of behavior that is most immediately affected by that choice, as a Catholic, you would say, is our worship. So what makes us the church, we believe, is our is how we worship that and we believe that how we worship governs what we believe so it clearly it includes the, the creed and all the, the the sort of values that we would say make us christian make us catholic but um ultimately our worship is the fundamental human activity that um directs all of those values because how we worship is how we relate to God personally. So it is the worship, the expression of religious values in relation to God that set the tone, set the type, if you like, mm -hmm. for a religious culture. And because those religious values are the fundamental values of that govern everything else we do, um, it is the culture of faith that then becomes the dominant influence on the contemporary culture, the wider culture. And that's true even if we have no faith. What you end up with is a culture of no faith, if you see what I mean. Oh, it's, it's that fundamental question that governs everything. So as a Catholic, I would look at the art and the, the culture that is associated with worship um, so this is the design of churches, the design of the, the art, the music, uh, the forms of behavior associated with that encounter, that, that fundamental encounter mm -hmm. with God. Um, and I would look at other Christian denominations and say, okay, you don't have ex necessarily exactly the same form of worship as me, probably very close, in many ways, in important ways, uh, the same. Um, but those are governing then the, the, our pattern of behavior in the wider world. Um, and that's the connection. And, and you believe that the religious practice, the, uh, the liturgy, the worship, uh, the community's behaviors in that moment give expression to or, or give some kind of shaping, have, have a shaping influence on culture and subsequently the arts. Is that my understanding? I mean, is that, yeah. is that correct? So it works its way out. 
Now, there are other influences which are not religious that uh, you know, relate to a particular time or a particular place. place. Um, atheist materialists tend to focus on uh, socioeconomic factors exclusively. Uh, I, I say they are present, but they're not the, 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 the they're an overlay, shall we say, mm -hmm. on the religious impact. But the wellspring of culture is uh, religious is religious practice. That is the dominant form. And just to give you a little example of how that works practically, um, a nice example of that would be in England, you had in the early 19th century, um, an architect called Pugin, who designed churches in what he called the pointed style. He was reacting against neoclassicism, which he didn't like. And he's, and as a Christian, um, and he was a Catholic convert. He said, look, our, our fundamental style is the Gothic style. He called that pointed architecture. And he analyzed it and started to create churches uh, in that style. The interior of those churches was filled with Gothic style art in, the, in an early 19th century form. So his analysis was brilliant in that it became an expression that was consistent with the tradition that he was looking at, but also of its time and place and spoke powerfully to everybody in Victorian England. So then it spread across the, the UK and you not only had churches in that style, the Houses of Parliament, civic buildings mm -hmm. started to be built in that style, derivative of, you know, of the the style of the highest human activity worship and uh, directed from it and both point and then pointing to it if you see what i mean it's yep. an yep. expression of but at the same time priming us to to worship god when we get in the church and then you have tower bridge for example this is a bridge this it's not really a, a civic building a government building but it's just a bridge but it's built in that style. They became iconic buildings. And then the Americans looked at this and thought, well, we're of a similar culture and we it, this appeals to us. We think this is beautiful. And you started to get Gothic churches and civic buildings mm -hmm. in America. Yep. Libraries, for example, built in the Gothic style. And then right up to the 1930s, in pre-World War II America, uh, the Ivy League universities and many other college campuses were built in this style not as churches but as educational institutions sure. but, right. but in a style that was derived from and pointing to the the um, religious activity and in this way it preserved um, and spoke of and helped to conserve christian values it was done in a uniquely American way. Mm -hmm. They adapted it and just naturally reflected the, a style that was appropriate to the people it was for. So they preserved American values, which are rooted in the Judeo-Christian worldview um, and were consistent with what the, the goals of education at the time. Interestingly, modern educators in those places, uh, I'm in Princeton, they recognize this and so and they don't like those values at all so they they commission buildings that look like um every sort of ugly high rise in a modern city a, a brutalist design pretty much yeah. Yeah. because they know that it, it counters the traditional view they, they mm. understand this mm. and so what i hear you saying from that anecdote is the way in which the architect with that imagination and an appreciation of a tradition that re is revitalized in a given moment can then ripple outward, right? To have yeah. an effect across a much larger span. Absolutely. Ripple outwards is a lovely way of putting it. It, it just seeps its way out and connects everything like onion rings. You know, there's the, the layers of an onion with That's the right. still center That's being right. got. Well, I, I, you've, You've hinted at the importance of what we could define as a liberal arts education and how important that is in the study of, the appreciation of, and the production of beauty. 
and how that might contribute to the common good, as you just described it with your yeah. anecdote. But you also were very specific and, and outline a bit of this in your book that you were trained as an artist under what is known as the academic method. And yeah. you hinted at it already in our conversation. Could you give us a little more detail around how that pr approach differs from what is typical today? Okay, so in your mainstream art school, um, it, 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 they're not all identical, but for the most part, um, you're not even learning to imitate, learning drawing and painting skills and learning to imitate nature. Um, so there's just the fact that you're even trying to do that is a new thing. So the basis of the academic method is that it, you're learning skills by which you can look at something and paint what you see. So you're learning to imitate. And uh, this goes further than that. The academic method was a method that was developed in the uh, art schools of the high Renaissance and really established firmly in the early 17th century. And they called them academies because they wanted to uh, evoke a sense of ancient learning. Mm -hmm. and, you know, they were referring to Plato's academy. Sure, so sure. The method became associated with that and was called academic. So it's not that it's cerebral, it's that it's associated with the academies as the name of the school. Um, now, the, the, the way that I would characterize this rigorous way of drawing is that they recognized that um, in order to look at something, you see that I move around my head around quite a bit as a natural sort of uh, mannerism that I have. But when I'm looking at things, I might turn my head from one side to another. And then the, the memory of what I see as I scan, like a cursor across, across a, sc a screen, um, contributes to a single impression of what I see. However, if I just keep my head absolutely still, which is not always an easy thing to do, <laughs> I have a, a line of vision, an angle of vision, uh, naturally, if I'm like most people, of about 15 degrees. And so if I want to look simultaneously at something on the left, I, I'm trying to do it with my hands, what, one side and then the other, uh, and imagine that this hand, if you're looking at the screen, on the right, I have the thing I'm copying, and on the, the left, I have the painting, the, the actual copy, and the best way to compare them is, is to look at them simultaneously without having to move my head around. So they have to be within a 15-degree arc of radius, arc of turn. Now, in order to do that, I have to retreat. I have to, I set my, the thing I'm copying up, I put it next to the easel and the painting. I put the two together side by side and I retreat back far enough so that I can see without moving my head, both the object I'm painting and the, the, the painting itself, the, the canvas, if you like. So I might set up, if I'm doing a portrait, I'd set up the person to, uh, right beside the canvas. And then I step back until I can see both simultaneously. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. way I can compare the two and, and see how what I'm drawing matches um, the object itself, that matches nature. Now, Typically, to get 15 degrees of arc, you need to go back um, three times the maximum dimension of the painting. So if I have um, a painting that is, for example, five feet by four feet, that's a large painting, right. I'd have to retreat 15 feet in order to get that into a single uh, look. And so what you're doing is, if you go to pl places that study the academic method, they mark a spot on the floor that's, mm. that gives you that angle, and you retreat, you observe the two directly in a single glance, look at something that, is, that needs correcting or something that needs to be introduced, <clears throat> and then you march forward 
paint it from memory of what you saw back, you know, way back, looking at both of them. And then having painted it or drawn it, you retreat back to the, your mark again and compare and see what you do. And so you continually correct what you've done. Hmm. And, that, and, and it can take a long time. And clearly, as you get better, you get quicker. But it's just a very systematic way of looking and drawing. Scientific, even. Uh, I, I'm drawn to this notion that somehow in, in, in making that comparison and in producing the imitation uh, of the natural object, person or other, uh, you are you're being very again purely scientific. That you're trying to obtain a knowledge of that object, which is thus reproduced in in the work. Yes. Yeah. This back okay. and forth. Sorry, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say that the the ultimate goal when you become a master of this is having developed the skill of of imitation, precise imitation. Then you transcend that. And you can imitate what you see in your imagination, precisely. Mm. Then you are the true artist who is creating. And typically what artists do is a bit of both. They look at nature, they pull things together, they modify it. They, but the true artist can then uh, manifest their, the, their imagination. That is the use of the creative imagination. Um, and that is the pattern of traditional artistic training and how creativity was instilled you imitate the master the master humbly you you actually copy initially old masters then you copy nature as well and then ultimately you hope to transcend that so that you you're able to um adapt what you see to your own style while being consistent with the tradition why why do you think that this more rare uh, academic approach uh, again of the academies is more effective uh, well one is it just emphasizes practice and correction and patience these are not values that people um are think are important today the there's no emphasis on no, nobody's asking me when i'm doing this how do you feel at this point you know, <laughs> You know, are you feeling angry? Can you incorporate that into the painting? That doesn't come into it. That's the romantic uh, impulse, which has no place in this, actually. Um, and ultimately, that dominated. And, and to the point, it, 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 it infiltrated the academy so that by the 19th century, you had uh, both taking place. But uh, the, the logic of having the two next to each other is, simply is not coherent. And so in the end, after the Impressionists, they, the academic method was rejected altogether. It, just, mm. it was just about emotion and how you express that yeah. on the canvas. Well, in this vein, as we look to past masters, your book identifies within the religious traditions, specifically the, the Catholic tradition, but the religious Christian and Catholic traditions, that that art sound art if you will is coming from three essential traditions three essential schools perhaps uh that of iconography uh the gothic which you made mention of earlier and the baroque yeah. it might be helpful if if those are the big three uh, as you articulate them could you describe some of the distinctive features of each and explain how a contemporary religious artist can draw upon them creatively so it'd be nice to see that in play. Yeah. Okay, so those three um, are considered, again, in the Catholic world as authentically liturgical. In other words, it's not saying there should be no other styles of art, sure. but it's saying that it, they are well established as being connected with right worship from a Catholic point of view. So others may modify their view on that basis. And even as a Catholic, this is not dogmatic statement. It, right. I get this from Benedict the Sixteenth, who I'm, who I admire, and so in the same book, the Spirit of the Liturgy, um, and I also it happens to coincide with my personal taste. So I'm always going to champion that. And I use it <laughs> to persuade people of, of my own taste as well. So you know, I can't claim this is an absolute statement of truth, but as a starting point. The, the reason that, that he, I think, Benedict picks those three traditions is that 
he observes um, the way um, and the accounts over centuries, shall we say, and the effect that this has on people as they work as they worship. So it seems to engender in those who worship the, a, a disposition that is appropriate for the worship of God. Now, immediately there are judgment calls here that people are going to disagree with, but that's the, that that's effectively what he's trying to do. And I would say that even if you don't accept that these three traditions are uh, a core, um, that's the question you ought to be asking. What is the disposition you want in the worship of God? Mm -hmm. And uh, what sort of art seems to engender that? And that probably is going to be the one that is most powerful in, in being the wellspring of a, a Christian culture or a culture that embodies Christian values, even <clears throat> if you're not a believing Christian, you just want to promulgate those values. So the three styles are, first of all, the iconographic, which we tend to associate with um, Russian and Greek icons today, the, the Byzantine churches, sure. for example. Um, this, this style developed um, in about the 5th century AD, and there are many variants of this in the East and West, uh, Eastern Western Church, uh, but really was the style that dominated East and West in all Christian art up to about 1100 AD uh, in various forms. I haven't got to, you know, I'd need a, a, you know, a whole string of lectures to explain sure. exactly wh um, what I mean by that, but there were variations, so Romanesque art and Etonian art and uh, Macedonian iconographic art are, are seen as having common elements. And it's highly stylized. It looks very flat and symbolic in nature and was designed to communicate to us a sense of people in heaven, what John Paul II called eschatological man, man in the eschaton in heaven. Now, it, it, I don't know that the, the argument is that this is precisely what people look like in heaven. It's more that it's communicating to us through this partial abstraction <clears throat> an understanding of, of, of what the person is like in heaven. So for, just to give you an example, the halo, which you see around somebody's head, the golden disc, is actually a symbolic representation of light emanating from the person. Mm. And that indicates that when we're in heaven, we're in union with God and we're partaking of the divine nature and, and actually shining with the divine light that is described in the book of Revelation. You know, there is no need for lamplight or sunlight. We, we just see because they're the, the, what they call the uncreated light of God. Um, in, and for the same reason, there are no cast shadows in icons. Uh, there's a certain amount of tonal variation to describe form. You know, that if I open my mouth, my mouth is, is going to be dark inside. Mm -hmm. um, but there are no strongly cast shadows because if I'm a source of light, that will obliterate the shadow from any external source of light. Right. And even down to the fact that there is no glint on the eye in icons, which... The glint is a reflected light, um, but as, as the eye is the source of light in the icon, in, the, in our understanding of the heavenly mode of existence, uh, there would be no glint. So it's sure. absent. The, um, it's easier then to go to, uh, to skip the Gothic in the order in which I do it and go to the, the Baroque. So... What you have is a steady increase in the West from about 1100 in naturalism. And there are sort of historical reasons for this. It's a gradual shift in the emphasis, a greater interest in the emphasis of what they're trying to portray because of a, a greater interest in the natural world. Mm -hmm. It's from this sparked scientific research, for example, due to the incorporation of the um, the philosophy of Aristotle into Western thinking in the Middle Ages, but this was reflected in art by greater naturalism. And uh, it took various forms over centuries, uh, but by the time you get to the, the Baroque, uh, you have a highly naturalistic form. 
that in contrast to the iconographic has a, a huge contrast between light and dark. There are deeply mm -hmm. uh, deep cast shadows. So sure. if you imagine a Caravaggio painting, that's right. You have an external source of light somewhere off, you know, off stage left, <clears throat> and then everything is uh, is in the shadow, is in the light of that, and there are deep shadows. Now, theologically, what that is trying to show is uh, the the what you might call historical man or fallen man. Um, in other words, man after the fall. Mm -hmm. um, so there is the presence of evil and suffering now in this scene. It's it's um, and that's indicated uh, in the visual language of light and dark. And the dark represents the presence of evil and suffering, which is we know is in the world. But it's contrasted very sharply with the light. And the idea here is that the light overcomes the darkness. Mm -hmm. And so it's trying to portray to us, uh, quite apart from the content, you know, what is actually painted through a visual vocabulary, a, a, a light that overcomes the darkness. In other words, Christian hope that mm -hmm. transcends suffering. So in this life, um, we, uh, faith in God and the Christian faith may not remove the suffering, but it does transcend it. In other words, it offers, I believe, a consolation that is greater and deeper than the suffering. The, the, uh, so you can be both suffering and joyful at the same time. And mm. the extreme example of this would be the saints who praise God as they're being stoned to death. Saint Stephen, mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm after after pentecost now i hope i never have to face that test i have to say but um in in its own way that is the christian life we we see meaning in suffering mm -hmm. because we have a faith that there is something greater present and that provides us a consolation in the present and that language of light and dark is seeking to communicate that the gothic is historically is a sort of transition between the two a gradual increase in naturalism and so i think of that historically as rather like the gothic spire which spans the divide shall we say between earth and heaven mm -hmm. uh, visually mm -hmm. uh, gothic art speaks of uh, people in this life who are on the pilgrimage to heaven because they're part of the church mm -hmm. so there is still some evil and suffering. That naturalism is there. There's some reference to shadow and to uh, in various visual devices which speak of the natural world. But at the same time, many elements also that speak of the heavenly, uh, the heavenly world. And so for the baptized who are in the church, we're on that pilgrimage mm -hmm. to a greater or lesser extent. So the Baroque art speaks of the, the starting point, and it says there is evil and suffering, but there's hope in God. Gothic art speaks of us beginning that journey to God and to heaven through the church. And the iconographic art speaks of our heavenly destination. Mm. Now, if a religious artist today, contemporary religious artist was, was really desirous to draw upon this tradition and yeah. all three of those do you think there are ways in which studying them practicing them perhaps apprenticing to them could in fact produce uh, a, a, a creative or productive artist yes so th the way that i would do it, do this uh, uh, is follow the traditional method of learning to paint um, and it is this process of imitation and direct observation of nature. So learn to draw and paint the, the, the musical scales of painting and drawing uh, uh, or of, of visual art is drawing and observing nature. You just, mm -hmm. you just do it relentlessly, you know, and if you use the academic method, all well and good. So you learn that skill. Then you probably, you can start to imitate the art that you're naturally drawn to. So there's nothing wrong with discerningly has to be done very well looking at different styles <coughs> excuse me um 
drawing in different elements. But probably, even if you're going to do that, you're going to do it with your base within one of those traditions. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. select the one that you're most naturally drawn to. Certainly imitate by degrees the others, but become fully um, immersed in one of those traditions. Then, as you get, start to um, break out, like the the the, uh, the bird leaving the nest, shall we say, mm -hmm. you then get to the level where you transcend that. And what governs what you do and how you draw on those different elements will be the needs of society today. So you need to have an understanding of modern society, um, of human needs in that context, and you need to understand how to adapt what you know <clears throat> in order to serve that society today. So that is the, that, you know, when I describe Pugin with the Neo-Gothic, mm -hmm. he started by imitating Gothic architecture, but then quickly moved to a form that was a development of it and spoke to the Victor to Victorian society. Now, if an architect or an artist was to do that today, it's not going to look precisely like that. It will clearly be derivative of it in some way, but it will bear the mark of this place and this time, hmm. uh, if he's a good artist or she's a good artist. Um, and that's really what, what we're aiming for. Uh, but it, it's always better to work from within a tradition um, and then also develop the spiritual life, and we can talk a little bit about that, that cultivates uh, an openness to inspiration. We can't, no one can guarantee that, of course, because God inspires whomsoever he pleases. And then to respond to God's grace is a movement of the heart, which doesn't come through a sort of conveyor belt spirituality. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, there are things that can be done that incline people to that disposition. Mm. I'm so encouraged by the fact that your approach to the arts draws upon a tradition while recognizing that the contemporary moment in which we live yeah. is hungry, that there is a, a desire for this work and that the, the artist who is truly attentive to the craft will also come to know his contemporaries, his cohort, yeah. so that he can speak through the grammar of, of art to them. Yes. I, the, I, and I think I've been thinking about this, especially in the context of, of classical education. So um, it does mean that we need an enculturation, but also a deep enculturation, not just of the general um, picture, shall we say, of Western culture, but also of where we are now. So a, 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 an American enculturation in the right mm -hmm. sort of way. Mm -hmm. And so I was thinking about this. So, for example, in a classical education, you would look at the Greeks and say they had Homer, at the Romans and say they had Virgil, for example, and Cicero. And I'm not an expert in these things, but they were developed in order to communicate um, in a culturally, shall we say, the values of that society. Mm -hmm. So the question then is, even if I'm not a believer in in the Christian faith, but I believe in um, establishing a beautiful American culture in order to preserve American values, um, then I would say that the natural thing to do is immerse yourself even more deeply in salvation history, which is the Christian roots from which America comes from, and then the particular American expressions of that. Um, and I would say that, for example, something like studying the Psalms and uh, uh, even praying them and learning them, because this is how traditionally those values were imparted to people. This is the poetry of mm -hmm. salvation history. Mm -hmm. And then learning how and, and studying how those are manifested in the American experience, which is really an Anglo-American experience, mm -hmm. American mm -hmm. Catholicism public that comes out of the the Eng of English roots, of the, right. the English understanding mm -hmm. of the world. And it strikes me, this is just a personal view, that one way of doing this actually is, is to look at the Book of Common Prayer, which 
goes across and the Psalter in the Book of Common Prayer mm -hmm. and that the pattern of worship, which incidentally matches those cosmic patterns. Mm -hmm. uh, and so if you um, actually, um, even if you view it as, say, a Jordan Peterson might, a detached observer who yeah. sees this as a, a, a myth of our nation that um, is necessary in order to communicate the values, but has no opinion on the truth of the actual uh -huh. material. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Even if you can view it like that, if you believe in this nation, um, I would say that's a good thing to do because the values that it instills support the nation. They're what it's rooted in. And that mode of expression, which comes out of the English tradition, it goes, it, it begins in pre-Reformation for the Catholics who are worried about this, but nevertheless is continued in uh, the post-Reformation form of the Anglican, uh, Anglican worship and then extended into many other Protestant denominations. Um, and even if you're um, not Christian, you can look at those in that way and say, this is a, a way that traditionally the American worldview, mm -hmm. which participates in, is a particular expression of the Christian, Judeo-Christian worldview, um, is transmitted most powerfully. Mm. The, the, the other thing is that we, it's, we can't be neutral on this, I don't think, that what, what we see today is a, a sort of false salvation history that touches people's hearts deeply and comes out of Marxist theory, you know, various iterations, the latest one is sort of whatever expression of critical theory is there. There is this you know, promise of a utopia and this view of society which speaks to the future and speaks to people's hearts deeply. And the way to compete with that is, of course, is part in rational argument and looking at the flaws in what, what are, are those ideas and the misery that it brings, but also to impart deeply to people um, in a way that uh, occupies their hearts um, what is good. And I would say that if you don't like what you see on the left, and I don't, um, then you offer an alternative that speaks to those values, even if you don't think the explanation of why they're true is correct. Now, I do. I, I'm a Christian. I'm a Catholic. I'm fully committed to that. But I would say that uh, people who aren't, um, who are worried about what they see in the same way that I am and share my cultural sensitivities, could think about that very strongly. Mm -hmm. In the uh, Anglophonic world, you have recommended that we read our Cranmer. I will imply or infer rather that uh, we would do well to, to look at the cadences of King James, for example, uh, that in, in the Psalter yes. in particular. Right? Yes. Yep. Um, and if there was one last piece of advice that you could give to a parent or a teacher who, like you, shares these sensitivities, these sentiments, that beauty needs to be brought to the fore in the school, in the home. How do we help the young to discover this way? What, what would you tell them? Well, I would say um, from the starting point of what you generally see in a classic, a, a classical education is really important. What, what the sort of thing that Great Hearts offers, really hugely important but ensure <clears throat> that there's an element of creativity in that as well. And that means giving time to people. It, 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 there's, there will, it will seem as though painting, for example, is just recreation. It's, it's a break from the serious business of learning, mm -hmm. but actually start to value this as something that in, um, inculcates an, an authentic creativity in combined with the the prayer, I think, and the understanding of the imagery of the Psalms, which we look at nature and we see a symbolism in it. You know, it speaks to us of the beauty of God. The Psalms order that so that they tell us how it speaks of the beauty of God mm. in a very deep way that is connected to the, the values that we want to promote. So I would encourage that. I would say I, I'm going to give a little sort of 
uh, advertisement here for the courses we have at Pontifex University. For those who are interested in getting more deeply into what I'm describing and understanding more deeply, of course, there's my book, The Way of Beauty, but there are um, courses uh, that can be taken for credit at the master's level uh, that actually extend those ideas. And I think would be great. Uh, that's what I, I created them with this in mind for teachers in the classical academies mm -hmm. um, in order to start to create a syllabus if you like, or a curriculum that actually reflects these values. So the, the courses that I teach in the Master of Sacred Arts program are foundational to this. So you don't need to do the whole masters. You don't want to, but some of those courses will deepen your understanding. And my hope is that it might form teachers who are then able to adapt those principles mm -hmm. at all levels in, in education. Um, and I don't know if it helps, but we are actually accredited for continuing education. So if there is a if there's a budget or something that can mm -hmm. be directed mm -hmm. towards that, that might help to pay for it a little bit. I don't know. Um, Dave, David, yeah. uh, we will be happy to place uh, the the link, the URL to Pontifex and to the courses that you're that you're recommending. It's the type of thing that uh, I think teachers and school leaders and parents even some parents are going to be interested in because we recognize the need, the desperate need to offer an alternative, as you have said, yeah. a beautiful alternative, right to um, just much of the, the decay that we see around us. So thank you for your time. Thank oh, you for this you. book, uh, The Way of Beauty. We will certainly recommend that folks take a look at this. Uh, and as they listen to uh, this conversation, if they want to know more, we'll direct them uh, your way. <laughs> do, do. I love to hear from people, by the way. I'm always delighted to get people emailing me and contacting me. Thank you so much for the conversation, David. We look forward to this. Absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Bye now.